Retribution is a primary, perhaps the primary, justification for punishment. It has been historically, and my guess is it still remains so morally. Essentially, retribution holds that the punishment should fit the crime. That the more serious the crime, the greater the punishment should be. The less serious the crime, the less the punishment should be. Opponents of retribution have often equated it with revenge. But retribution is not revenge. They do come from a common wellspring, and that is a desire to inflict pain and suffering on those who have inflicted pain and suffering on others. But there's a huge difference between retribution and revenge. Revenge need not be proportional, and revenge need not be appropriately directed. If a member of my community kills a member of your community, and then you kill my entire community, you are engaging in revenge. You are not engaging in retribution because it is not deserved and it is not limited and it is not proportional. Retribution requires that it be limited, proportionally directed, and deserved. Revenge does not. Now again, those who attack retribution on the grounds that it's nothing but revenge ought to understand a couple of things, which is if Retribution is revenge, then deterrence is terror. And Thomas Hobbes knew that. A great anti-retributivist that he was, the first modern, the first author of the first modern book of psychology, first modern book of economics. When he said the aim of punishment, A-Y-M-E, the aim of punishment is not revenge, it's terror. Because that's what deterrence is. Deterrence is terrorism. We threaten you with pain and suffering in order to terrify you out of doing what you otherwise might be inclined to do. So retribution requires that the punishment should fit the crime. Now, the, now what makes a crime more or less serious so that it should have more or less punishment attaching to it? Traditionally, it's the culpable mental state. That is to say, intent is worse than recklessness, recklessness is worse than negligence, and of course negligence is worse than a pure accident. And then within intent, we've classically distinguished various types that are more or less serious. Cold-blooded intent is worse than passionately, adequately provoked intent. Carefully planned and methodically carried out is worse than sudden intent. So that the retributivist would classify crimes according to the culpable mental state. But part of the challenge is also according to the harm to some degree. That is, if I shoot point blank at somebody and then miraculously that person's life is saved by a very skillful surgeon who just knows how to operate and she does it in just the way that the person's life is saved, but only a very skillful surgeon could have done it. Why should I get the benefit of the fact that my victim happened to live through no good doing of mine? And so the contemporary retributivist is challenged by how much should the harm count as well as the culpable mental state. This challenge goes back all the way to ancient times as to whether, for example, an attempted murder is as bad as a murder. Plato wrestled with that and the question of moral luck. How much should luck count in terms of the consequence? And there's no easy answer to it as we try to make the punishment fit the crime. But the most important part in today's administration of criminal justice that deeply offends the retributivist is the fact that daily life inside a prison in no way resembles the nature of the crime and the seriousness of the crime. The fundamental retributive principle is proportionality. Let the punishment fit the crime. And yet, once inside, the officers will tell you, the officers who are administering the supposed punishment and, and the inmates or prisoners will reflect the same thing. What a man did out there is none of my business. I don't care what he did or why he did it. I only care how does he behave once he's inside. And even the classification of prisons into maximum, medium, and minimum security 
shows the absence of retributive administration. Because the lifestyle inside is a function of how likely you are to escape, not what you did out there and with what culpable mental state. The fundamental change that's necessary in this society for it to become more, for prison administration to become more just and more retributive is to consciously structure the daily life inside prison so that it more nearly and accurately reflects the nature of the crime that got you there. Not just in the length of the sentence, but in the lifestyle that you actually experience day to day. So those who commit relatively trivial crimes or those who commit serious but nonviolent crimes, though they may have longish sentences, but are fundamentally not nearly as bad as others who've committed violent crimes against unwilling victims, should have a very different lifestyle inside the prison. And when they're ready to come out and be released, we should have a real commitment to their rehabilitation. The programs inside to enable them to become productive members of society, for them to replace their values that led them into the prison, and enabling them to have skills that will make them productive members of society, those programs should be real and they should be funded, well-funded. And they're not today. Instead, the principal justification for punishment is simply incapacitation, safety. Keep the people safe from the prisoners, keep the prisoners safe from each other, and keep the staff safe from the prisoners. That doesn't accomplish anything. It doesn't accomplish justice for those who deserve the unpleasantness of a life inside prison, the worst of the worst of the worst. And it doesn't accomplish the social benefits that we should derive from taking those who never got a break in life and giving them a set of skills and helping them develop a set of values so that when they are released, they can become rich, vital, vibrant members of society. It fails in both directions. We went through a period of time in which we decided that drugs were the scourge of society. Uh, they may be, but not necessarily the classic drugs that we abolished. And when we went through that time, legislatures reflecting that, the so-called war on drugs, enacted statutes and attached punishments to the nonviolent sale of drugs that are appalling. They are unjust. They are grossly disproportionately long. Any true retributivist must react to that um, strongly, negatively, that we are grotesquely over-imprisoning groups of people. Drugs are a very complicated issue. Not, you hear on one hand some people saying, well, we should just simply legalize drugs. Let me tell you what happens if we legalize drugs. Two things, at least. Number one, we would fail to recognize that all drugs are not alike. When I was in prison, spending the time documenting life inside, for many years of that, the drug of choice was boat, called boat, called lovely, called love boat. It was marijuana soaked in PCP. Its net effect is that it would make you feel both omnipotent and paranoid so that everybody was out to get you and nobody could stop you. Under the influence of boat, uh, individuals were attacking whole groups. Unarmed individual prisoners were attacking groups of officers or groups of other prisoners. I've heard uh, countless stories out on the street of what people have done under the influence of boat. Uh, one guy took his girlfriend's child and put him in an oven to cook him like a turkey. It's a vicious drug. It's a horrible drug. It should never be legalized, and those who sell it should be punished harshly for it. Crack cocaine, I understand. There is a racial component in punishing crack the same way you punish powdered coke. And there is. It correlates with race to some great degree. But they're not the same drug, though they might be the same derivative drug. They're not the same drug. The effects under crack are much worse than the effects under powdered coke. So we've got to become more discriminating among the drugs. We have to re-examine the sentences of so many people who are serving life for crimes that don't even arguably deserve anything close to life for the nonviolent sale of large quantities of drugs. We've got to more nearly tailor the punishments to fit 
the moral blameworthiness of the crime. But I'll tell you something else that will happen if we legalize drugs. You know, you hear people say, well, if we legalize drugs, the crime rate would drop enormously because all these drug crimes would no longer be crimes. That's how we eliminate or diminish crime, just legalize it. Many robbers told me, many of the older robbers told me that they used to be robbers and then they switched to drugs because it's bigger bang for the buck. If you legalize drugs, of course, the price of the drugs drops. We're going to see what's happening with pot now that it's been legalized in uh, um, well, Boston is the newest place that's now selling it. Not Boston, Massachusetts, sorry. The price will drop, which will, of course, make the crime less attractive to deal in it. Many of those drug dealers will switch back to robbery. I would predict if we legalize drugs to a substantial extent, you will see a rise in robbery, significant rise in robbery. That's not reflected well in the literature or widely in the literature. But we've got to look at the grossly disproportionate sentences that came out of the war on drugs. And we should be making every effort to releasing those who are not dangerous, who have been overpunished. That's another thing, by the way, about retribution. If we really are committed, if, if we really are committed retributivists to seeing justice done, then of course we do support the Innocence Project. We do support highly competent defense counsel. There must be adequate funding for defense counsel. There is to a much greater degree than opponents of either the death penalty or punishment itself would have you believe. But in many states it's inadequate. And so every true retributivist should be very supportive of adequate funding for not only those who defend potential criminals, but those who try to examine after the fact and find and see if there are truly innocent people who are in prison. That's another irony, by the way, about the death penalty. The death penalty keeps our focus on possible innocence because as any decent human beings, we want to be really sure before we kill someone because of the irrevocability of it. There are people who are serving life sentences who are languishing in prison, whom no one gives a damn about, whom, whose innocence nobody cares about or investigates. The death penalty tends to bring the attention. The irony is, if we abolish the death penalty tomorrow, you will see much less concern with innocence in prison than you see today directed at death row. So I wrote my crime and punishment memoir, which is the culmination of decades of reflection on the experience of documenting life inside prisons and thinking about the principles of criminal law. And I titled it very carefully. It's called The Death of Punishment. It's not called The Punishment of Death because the death penalty is a subset of a much deeper issue, and that is punishment itself. We are a culture increasingly ashamed of punishing. If you read the mission statements of the Department of Corrections in the United States, and I've read them all, you will not find the word punishment or any of its synonyms in any mission statement in any Department of Corrections in the United States. It's nobody's job to punish. When you ask the officers, they say, it's not my job to punish. Again, what a man did out there is none of my business. I only care how he behaves once he's inside. And it often turns out that the most vicious criminals on the outside, the ones who prey on the elderly, on children, on the handicapped, the ones who prey on the especially vulnerable victims, the biggest cowards, the most vicious cowards outside, once captured and confronted with overwhelming state power, become the docile pussycats inside the prison. Very reliable from the point of view of corrections, always doing what they're told to do, not acting up, not acting out. So they may have been extraordinarily vicious on the outside, but when you take a perspective as corrections takes, that rejects the significance of the past and only looks at the present and future behavior inside the prison, they're the ones that you least want to punish because they're reliable and they're docile. 
Their behavior is exemplary, inside. Let them out, they'll turn back to the same vicious cowards they were on the outside. But the point is, they will tend to live relatively painless, pleasant lifestyles inside. That's fundamentally anti-retributive. And so we go back to the deepest question of all, which is the cultural shame in punishing. You'll see many people today increasingly disavow punishment itself of any sort. It's all and only about so-called restorative justice. Educate the criminal as to the pain and suffering that he has caused, the victims and the victims' families. Give the victims' families a sense of satisfaction at confronting the criminal and letting him know at the pain and suffering that they have felt from his despicable behavior. And once that's done, there's no point in punishing. From this point of view, not my point of view, it's anti-retributive, it's anti-justice. Because let's not forget, in the preamble to the United States Constitution, after forming a more perfect union, the second articulated purpose of the Constitution itself is to promote justice. And so when all is said and done, not only the death penalty, but the lifestyle inside prison is something we should be deeply concerned about in order to promote justice. We in society, we in law-abiding society, who aren't criminals, who may not even know any criminals, should very much care about the criminal justice system because it's all being done in our name. We, the people of the state, whose primary function it is to define, detect, prosecute, and punish crime, and occasionally we, the people of the United States, whose function it may be to prosecute and punish federal crimes. The punishments are occurring in our name. If prison is not accomplishing anything, if it's releasing dangerous people back out onto the streets, we may be its future victims, the victims of the failure of the criminal justice system. If the criminal justice system is over-punishing people and imposing pain and suffering on people who do not deserve it or do not deserve that much of it, that's being done in our name. And we are morally implicated in it. And so whether or not we imagine ourselves as potential victims or criminals, we should probably do as John Rawls suggested we do in The Theory of Justice, his classic book, which is impose a veil of ignorance between us and the system and not know actually what role we will play in it. Will we be juror? Will we be judge? Will we be victim? Will we be legislator? Will we be criminal? And we have an obligation to design and implement that system which most nearly approaches a morally rich sense of justice and safety.